I'll meet you in the book of Colossians. I want to minister tonight from a few verses of Scripture from Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. I have a really bad habit or a good habit. I'm not sure if it's good or bad. I think it's probably bad. I have a really bad habit of talking a long, long time at the top of sermons before I get to my text. And sometimes I end up uh, out ahead of myself, like even ahead of the Scripture, and I have to kind of read to catch up. So I'm going to shut up and not do that tonight, and I'm going to read for you one verse before I say another word from Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, because this verse gets us going where we need to go. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit. Different translations are going to have a little different sound depending on what you're reading, but we're in the same tone. A little different instrument, same tone coming through here. No one take you captive through philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition or basic principles or elementary principles, depending on your translation, to the elemental spirits of the universe and not according to Christ. Now, without stopping, let me read it again. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. Paul, I can't get in his head because I don't get to sit down and talk to him, but I can read the context of his letter and his other letters at large. Paul is nervous that the young church he's poured his life into is starting to sway and I don't mean they're starting to get their legs under them and live on their own and think for themselves. I think any teacher is happy to see that. They're starting to sway a little bit towards other philosophy, other ideas. And Paul's a little concerned that there's a thing called deceit entering in. Not deceit over theology, not deceit over wrong teachings about Jesus or the covenant, but this deceit that Paul calls human tradition, and the elemental spirits of the universe. And so he's really dealing, I think, based on the wording, with two basic ideas. I am very worried that you are listening too much to some things in the natural realm, and you're listening too much to some supposed things from the spiritual realm. This natural traditions of men, that's the phrase he uses, versus the elemental spirits of the universe. It's kind of a strange phrase. These elemental spirits of the universe being this invisible thing that we might call the systems or the powers that be. And so you are, you are confronted, and you all are every day. This isn't any different just because we're 2,000 years after the church of Colossae. You're confronted every day with the natural realm, and you're confronted every day with the supernatural realm. Now, the natural realm you can see. It's very obvious. It's the stuff in front of you. And the supernatural realm is not so obvious, but you know it's there. It's also why you believe in the Holy Spirit, because you know there's an unholy spirit. It's why you believe in listening to the voice of good as the Spirit speaks to you, because you know there's the voice of evil, because you've heard it. You've participated in it. You can't see it. You can't prove it, but you know it's there. And Paul's dealing with those two things. you got... The human tradition, the tangible, you've got the elemental principles of the universe, the invisible, the spirit dimension. Because I'm worried about you on both fronts. I'm worried about you being deceived by the natural realm, and I'm worried about you being deceived in the supernatural realm. Now, quite frankly, I don't share Paul's concern, say, for this room. I'm not even sure how much I share his concern for most believers I've, I've encountered, but I think it is worth us investigating what it was that Paul was so worried about and what might that look like today. For instance, human tradition is a phrase that when we think of it in Christian circles, we almost always think of as inherently bad, particularly in grace circles, because in grace circles we like to emphasize the relationship of grace versus the religion and a lot of us seem to pit religion versus relationship. I don't think that's actually a very fair pitting. And, and I've worked with you in some of our reviews of my first book a little bit, how my 
views over the years have changed between trying to call it a relationship versus a religion. James believed there was such thing as pure religion, undefiled, help the widows and the fatherless, keep yourself unspotted from the world. If you had told the early church there was no such thing as religion, they would have laughed. Of course there is. We're in one. And so are you. It's you're just following Jesus. Now, it, the problem is, is that it can't stop there. Because if it stops at being a religion, and it's just this thing you have that kind of defines your religious box on your resume, what religion are you, where do you go to church, then it doesn't really do you or the world much good. And so what really the, the revolution of grace has done is expand our understanding of religion to be something much broader, to include a relationship with a loving Father that causes us to go out and love the, the world the way Jesus loves it. That makes... To me, that, I, I follow that religion. I try to follow the religion of Jesus. Uh, I try to follow the, 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 the path of, of walking as he walked, living as he lived. But don't think human tradition and think necessarily bad. In, in fact, I don't think tradition is inherently bad. I think tradition connects us to our past. We're going to partake in a 2,000-year-old tradition tonight in this room called Communion. So if tradition is bad, then we shouldn't do anything that people have traditionally done. <laughs> and I know none of us truly believe that. And so Paul's not bemoaning tradition. In fact, I'll just say this. I think there are some traditions we very badly need to get rid of because they're only human tradition. They don't connect you to God. They just connect you to ideas and stuff and people. And some things are dragging us down because we won't let go of them. But tradition is not necessarily bad because some tradition connects you to God through your brothers and your sisters and through people. When we partake of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus, we're partaking in the oldest tradition in the church, right up there with baptism. There's a reason why we've held on to those sacraments for 20 centuries. is because it's a deep root system that runs way back into the church family so that we realize we're participating in a tradition bigger than us. So why does Paul then attack human tradition? Because what happens is our traditions can become more important than our growth. So whenever we look back on tradition and hold on to it and don't move forward, what happens is our traditions become pillars in our church and in our lives rather than moving forward. And the Holy Spirit is about moving you forward. You can hold on to the traditions of your past. You can hold on to what dad knew. You can hold on to what grandfather knew. You can hold on to the place you were raised. All of those things are fine. But when human tradition interferes with what you know in Christ, that was Paul's fear. So once tradition becomes more important than responding to the Holy Spirit, and this is what's happened in a lot of our churches, and we've all lived through it and we've seen it. In fact, it's, it's for lack of a better term, it's ran some of us off from traditional Churches, it doesn't mean tradition's bad or traditional church is bad, but we've all been in scenarios where people held on to tradition and stopped listening to the Holy Spirit on telling them how to move forward. Stopped listening to the Spirit on transforming their minds so people stop thinking for themselves. They stop changing their mind about anything. It has to be the way it's always been done. We've always done it that way. Why would we always do it that way? I don't know, but we always did it that way, so we're going to keep doing it that way. And Paul said, I'm worried that we're going to turn into those kind of people. So I share his concern somewhat in that. I, I do sometimes worry that, we're, that we could become the kind of people that hold on to things that don't matter. I look at some of the ways that I was raised in church and the way we did worship. I can't even find some of them in the Bible, but we did them as if they were absolutely necessary for every time we come into the church house. We had to do that. It didn't even make sense at some point. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and list them off, but you've probably got your own list of them until you start to try to elbow your way out of that and realize that in Christ, it's about moving forward. In Christ, it's about love. In Christ, it's about knowing what He thinks of you, what He thinks of your neighbor. And if you've got to let go of traditions to learn that, great. That was kind of easy. Tradition is something we understand at almost an inherent level. What about that next one? The elemental spirits of the universe. So before I really dig into it, I want you to stay in Colossians 2, but I want you to jump all the way to verse 20. Because I want to show you that Paul repeats the phrase again. And sometimes in the repeat, we get to the bottom of the story. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Why do you submit yourself 
to regulations. I'll stop there. We're going to read a little more in a moment. But did you notice that Paul said the same phrase here that he said in verse 8 when he said, and I'll just repeat it for you, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit according to their human traditions and according to the elemental spirits of the universe, but not according to Christ. And then verse 20, if with Christ you died to those elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belong? So Paul declares that the Colossian church, when they met Christ, died to the powers that be. They died to the systems in the spirit realm. You are no longer bound by the elemental spirits of the universe. You are not in the realm of the spirit what you used to be. Now you might look the same, dress the same, talk the same, live in the same house, but something changed in you if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe. Contextually, these are the powers that govern the world. This is the system. So that system looks different in every culture and in every place, but it might sound a little bit like this. Are we captive to the spirit of the age? What's the spirit of the age? Sometimes it's materialism. Sometimes it's revolution. Sometimes it's politics. I am concerned that the church, not of Colossae, I know nothing about the church at Colossae. I am concerned that, say, the Church of America, which that would be an awfully big church. So maybe we should dwindle it down to the church at Chapin. Whatever town you're in, whatever place you go, the people that mattered to you. I'm not really that worried in this room about human tradition. My goodness, if we were worried about human tradition, we probably wouldn't be here on a Friday night talking about Jesus in this room. So it's sort of preaching to the choir to say, hey, are you ready to get rid of human tradition? I think you already kind of crossed that bridge. But if you died in Christ, you also died to the elemental spirits of the universe. You died to the system. And I don't mean the system of the church. I mean the systems of this world. And it does concern me, not just in a small way, that many of the places that I walk into, and myself included, even though I've died in Christ to that stuff, that it consumes my attention and it consumes my ideas and it consumes my hopes and my dreams and my money and my time. And in all of that, how much of this system of this world is persuading me through its philosophy and through its ideas to the place that it's difficult for me to find Christ because I can't cut through the politics and I can't cut through the materialism and I can't cut through the stuff in order to find the Jesus that saved me. And so sometimes we can't even decide if people are brothers and sisters in Christ based upon faith in Jesus. We've got to hear their politics first because that'll tell us if they're really saved. And so because we've got to cut through their politics and we've got to cut through their voting record and we've got to cut through their, where they were raised and we've got to cut through what kind of shows they watch and we've got to cut through what, they, they, what kind of clothes they'll wear, only then can we land. I think that's what Paul is scared of when it's called the elemental spirits of the universe. That's the ideas and the spiritual forces that fight against the simplicity of who we are in Christ that we're all a family in Christ Jesus, but we don't remember that the more we get consumed with the elemental spirits of the universe. The more the systems begin to define us and categorize us and block us off, the more we begin to push away the people that don't belong in our camp. And we are no longer unified by knowing Christ because we have too many other things that we notice first rather than the Jesus that is presented. And I think... If if Paul were in our place today, his concern would be much the same as it was to the church at Colossae. You see, he doesn't double down too hard on the human traditions part. Tradition's okay. If it keeps you from moving forward, it's not. Figure it out. But he doubles down on the elemental spirits of the universe part. Because that transcends time. That's the systems that keep cropping their head up in different times and different places and in different cultures. That's the spirit of the age. That's the stuff. And here's the fascinating thing. See, you didn't die to tradition. You died to the elemental spirits of the universe. You died to the systems of the world. You died to the old ways of judging yourself, 
the old way of governing yourself. So let's ask the question at the top of verse 20. Let's ask it with Paul. I can't answer it for you. I want you to answer it for yourself. And of course, it's rhetorical. It's one for you to wrestle with. The question sounds like this. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, why did you live as if you still belong to the world? And why do you submit to regulation? So let's start with if with Christ you died. My question to you is, did you? Did you die with Christ? Now you're sitting here breathing, so you didn't die in the physical realm. So of course that has nothing to do with having died with Christ. But I want to let you know whether you realize it or not, and I'm not trying to be insulting, but whether you realize it or not, what Christianity really is, is it's entering into the death of Christ on the cross. It's entering into his death so that you raise up in the fullness of his resurrection, but so that you begin to raise up in his resurrection. That's part of our baptism. We take you into the water where you identify with death. That's why you go underneath. But we don't leave you there. We bring you up so that you begin your resurrection. Our friend Brownie, about a month ago, finished his baptism. Your baptism ceremony immerses you in the death of Christ and raises you in a newness of life. When you step into the lobby of your resurrection, the first step of, of that next scene, you finish that baptism. You're, we're all still undergoing it in that we are all underneath the cross of Christ. We are all underneath what He has paid for on our behalf. Paul liked to say, He died, you died. Right? It, to the Galatians, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not really I. It's Christ that lives in me. We quote that so much, we miss the power of that first line. I am crucified with Christ. Not I will be, not I was. I am. Right now, while I'm speaking, I am also dead. If you said that in any other context, they'd think you're crazy. But that's actually the core of your theology as a Christian. I am crucified with Christ. It also sounds like this and to the Corinthians. Uh, we have concluded that if one man died, all men died. What that means is if Jesus died, so did I. So did you. That's quite a conclusion. If one man died, all men died. What Paul will say in Colossians 3 is, I died, my life is hid with Christ and God. So it's presented, Christian theology is presented as, you died off to all of the things in the realm of the Spirit, all of the condemnations and the judgments to the things in the Spirit. All of that is gone because of what Christ has done. In fact, Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that God has established us in Christ. God established us in Christ. God did it. I didn't do it. God put me in Christ. And then he says this. And Christ is our wisdom and our righteousness and our sanctification and our redemption. God planted me in Jesus, and Jesus is my wisdom, my righteousness, my sanctification, and my redemption. I'm not my wisdom. I'm not my righteousness. I'm not my... I can't make myself wise in Him. That's the role of the Spirit. I can't make myself sanctified in Him. That's the role of the Spirit. I can't redeem me. That's the role of the Spirit. I can't make me righteous. That's the role of the Spirit. All of these are done deals in Christ. I'm in Him. This is who I am. This is an expression of what I am. So I died to the elemental spirits of the universe because I don't belong to this place. And because I don't belong to this place, my value isn't determined by this place. This is something I wish I could sort of force feed into the minds and hearts of every person that I ever get the chance to preach to. This is the thing I try to say. People nod and they go right back out and they miss it. Your value can only be determined through Christ and His cross, it cannot be determined by the amount of money you make. It cannot be determined by where you live. It cannot be determined by who you know. It cannot be determined by your physical stature, your health, your wealth, your wisdom. All of those things are part of the elemental spirits of the universe. All of those things are set by the system. Because some systems are going to value you if you're a certain height. Value you if you make a certain amount of money. Value you if you have a certain skill set. 
Some systems, val okay, we love athletics, so let's think of it in athletics. Because you can, you can use an illustration of athletics in America and pretty much you can, everybody will understand what you mean. There are certain skill sets that are more valuable to football than they are to baseball, than they are to golf, than they are to tennis, right? Now, every weight coach understands this. Every strength and conditioning coach understands this. Every coach understands this. Athlete walks in with a certain skill set. They go, man, he'd make a good football player. Why? Because there's a certain set of skills that are needed for that sport. And it might not just be football player. It might be kicker. It might be quarterback. That guy make a good defensive end. Why? Side, speed. But he might not be the best tennis player based on his build. You know, just my, his body's not quite right. There's a certain skill set. And so we have no problem with that illustration really slotting value on each person in the room. Where's, and if I'm a good coach, what I want to do is find where you're the most valuable in the system. I've got an offense. I need a guy that can do this. I've got a guy that's valuable for this. He's not valuable for this. If I put him over here, not valuable. But if I put him over here, valuable. We're so accustomed to that. We take that, that's, that's an athletics illustration. Everybody gets that. But we actually do that in our lives then, where value gets determined based on our ability to produce, our ability to build. And we've even taken that and put it into the church, where we think people's value for how, boy, boy if we could just get them in our church. And every time we say something like that, we're borrowing the value system of the elemental spirits of the universe and we're applying it to the things of God because we've taken the value slot system the world uses and said, boy, if God could have that guy. I've said that. Boy, if God had that guy as a worship leader. Boy, listen to him sing. And, and, the, and who knows? Maybe not at all. The Holy Spirit knows his heart, knows his talent, knows his direction, knows his drive way more than I do but I'm guilty of slotting them based upon the value system of this world. And that's why I said earlier, I'd love to just force feed this into people. Say, your value has nothing to do, in the eyes of God, your value has nothing to do with what you produce. How smart you are, how wealthy you are, how, how plugged in you are, how many connections, how many people you know, none of that is your value. When Jesus arrived on the earth, he found a people in Israel that had no value left crushed underneath the Roman Empire. They had nothing of their own. Jesus spends big parts of his ministry saying, don't you know you're more valuable than sparrows? Don't you know you're more valuable than the birds of the field? Don't you know you're more valuable than the flowers, than the lilies in the, in the field? Why does he keep doing this? Because there are people whose values are screwed up. And I wonder if Jesus came and walked the earth today to teach us one-on-one -on -one if he wouldn't spend a ton of time talking about values. Like, son, you've determined your worth based upon this. Daughter, you've determined your worth based upon that. None of those things are you. And I think that's what scared Paul. Is that he said, I'm really scared you're going to be cheated. One of our translations says, cheated. You're going to be cheated through philosophy and vain deceit. You're being ripped off. You're being stolen from by a system that doesn't know you. By a system that doesn't value you. So how valuable are you? You are the righteousness of God. You have the wisdom of God. You have the redempt you, you've been redeemed in Christ. And you are sanctified and set aside for the master's use. The faster you know that, the more valuable you become to the people you encounter. Because that's a value that cannot be messed up by the things of this world. Now, if I can get you to believe that, and I don't know if I can, I'm trying. If I can get you to believe that, then the next verse becomes even more important. Let me read into it with that final question from verse 20. Why do you submit to regulations? 21, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. All these regulations refer to things that perish with the use. Did you notice in verse 21 there's quote marks around do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? There's quote marks because Paul is quoting the elemental spirits of the universe and what they say to you. Because the elemental spirits of the universe put moral regulations on you. They teach you value based upon your ability to do right and avoid wrong. You do not have this value system in your father. Your heavenly father doesn't place value on you based upon your ability to live right. 
See, because that's a trap as well. That's one of the traps the enemy gives us. Because the enemy puts in front of us and says, I know what you've been thinking, and you know what you've been thinking, and I know what you've been doing, and you know what you've been doing, and God's not going to use you. And God's looking for somebody that doesn't act like you act. And God's looking for somebody that doesn't do the things you've been doing. And that's whenever the value systems in the world start to be askew with the value systems that are lined up of the Holy Spirit. It's a pretty fascinating moment here in Colossians where the Apostle Paul says, don't, reg- don't s- put yourself underneath, don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. You see, these are moral restrictions. They don't help you overcome. They don't define you. And I think what has hurt the church is that we've become houses of morality. I don't mean we're being moral. I mean we're preaching morality. And if all we have to offer the world are lists of rules and regulations, then we don't have much. But the church has become a place where people say you go to learn how to live right. Right? They don't go to heal. They don't go to be with their family. They go to learn how to live right. Because we have this idea that what we're in the business to do is teach people how to live right. I am not here to teach you how to live right. I do not drive over here to teach you how to live right. I, do, I, I, have no, listen, I have no interest in teaching you how to live right. If I did, the fastest way to do it that would be pleasing would be to look at what people count moral and then hammer away at that list of moralities until you felt like you were accomplishing more of them than you were failing on. Then you could go out and say, I'm doing better because I went to that place. And to do that, I'd have to give you a list of don'ts, 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 don'ts. That's what Paul says. Why are you living according to don't taste, don't touch, don't handle? Don'ts are moral codes. He goes, you're better than this. You do not live in a system of do's and don'ts. You do not live according to the value systems of the world. And what's happened is the church has borrowed the idea that what we're supposed to do is tell people what to do. And that if they will do what we tell them to do and not do what we tell them not to do, they'll pay us for it. (laughs) They'll pay us for the privilege of telling them what to do and what not to do. And then the church becomes a temple of morality. And you you say, well, I don't think that's that big of a deal in America. Are you sure? Because we actually then filter that over into politics and in the way we run our governments and the way we set up our schools and the way we set up our homes because we go, it's got to be built on this principle. If it's not built on that biblical principle, if it's not built on that morality, I don't want anything to do with it. Not realizing that what we've done is we have begin to determine the value of systems based upon the codes of morality rather than being in Christ. And the system of that world is under no obligation to fall into any kind of code that the church thinks they should fall into. In fact, the moment that we begin to demand it, we know that we've fallen more into their system then they have fallen into ours. Because that system says, don't, don't, don't. Do, do, do. Don't the don'ts, do the do's. Two thumbs up. And when the church borrows that, we cheapen the righteousness of God in Christ. We cheapen the wisdom given to us in Christ. We cheapen the sanctification. We cheapen redemption. And we wonder why we're not making inroads in the world. Because we've borrowed their methods to define morality. Don't and do. Rather than Christ. And so in a lot of our circles, we're more content with lists of moral codes than we are with loving our neighbor. Because loving our neighbor is hard to quantify. You might get ripped off, right? You love your neighbor, you might get ripped off. How are you going to quantify how much you're supposed to keep loving your neighbor? I don't know how to tell you that. That's where we listen to the Holy Spirit. But I know we don't stop loving our neighbor because we get ripped off. In fact, we accept the reality that getting ripped off is part of the price we pay for loving our neighbor. At least that's the Jesus we serve who loves his neighbor all the way to the cross. (laughs) Who loves his neighbor on the cross. Who gets mocked by his neighbor on the cross. While he's saving the guy on the cross. Never ends. And yet, moral code doesn't define 
who Jesus is. Loving his neighbor defines who Jesus is. In fact, the religious powers that be of Jesus' day were most frustrated with Jesus, not because he loved his neighbor, but because he loved his neighbor outside the code. They had codes. They had rights and wrongs, and Jesus did the wrongs. See, sometimes we think, well, Jesus never did anything wrong. Well, he did if you, depends on who's governing what's wrong. You couldn't tell the religious leaders of his day he never did anything wrong. That's why they put him on the cross. He was doing something wrong every time they turned around. Now you go, oh yeah, but he wasn't in the eyes of God. Bingo! <laughs> Bingo! The system of the world doesn't look like the system of Christ. And so Jesus loved first, loved exclusively, and did not determine his value based on the moral code of his day. And he didn't preach the moral code to his disciples. And he didn't preach the moral code to the woman at the well or to the woman caught in the act of adultery. And not preaching the moral code doesn't mean he was soft on sin. It meant he loved sinners enough to know that all the codes will do is put you underneath the obligations of external moralities. And when you meet them, you will be proud. And when you fail in them, you will be at fault. And that's a value system that is beneath the sons and the daughters of God. And Paul said, you want to know what I'm most scared of? That you're going to buy that garbage. He said, I'm most scared that you're going to get infatuated with human tradition. I'm not too worried about it. But he said, what I'm really scared of is the elemental spirits of the universe. That stuff's powerful, man. And it looks so nice and round and holy. And it says, don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. And he says, you're going to get all infatuated by all of that don't, don't, don't. It's going to make you feel holy. It's going to make you feel special. It's going to make you feel righteous to tell people, don't, 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 don't. Do, 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 do. And Paul goes, all it does is put you back underneath what you came out of. A system that defines you based on your abilities rather than defines you based on Christ. All of these regulations, 22, all of them refer to things that perish with using. They're simply human commands and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom and they promote self-imposed piety and humility, severe treatment of the body, but there are no value in checking self-indulgence. Look at that. So if you give people a bunch of do's and don'ts, it does no value in fixing their problems. That's how Colossians 2 closes. And I have lived this out. If you have a list of do's and don'ts, it does nothing to fix you. It just puts you underneath <laughs> condemnation. It's so beneath what you were saved for. So I ask you the question again. Did you die in Christ? And if you died in Christ, then why in the world would you go figure out your value based on what you do? Because if you died in Christ then all those do's and don'ts don't make you who you are. Christ makes you who you are. Now, at this point, if I said that's all I have, and I bless you in Jesus' name, my detractors might be able to say, here's the problem with that kind of preaching, is that all it does is tell people who they are in Christ, and it lets them walk right out of the room with a whole bunch of garbage that's still in their lives and nothing's being done about it. And they're going to go back into that place next time. And he's still not going to tell them about all their garbage. And because they don't preach do's and don'ts, none of those people down there are going to be smart enough to know what not to do and what to start to do. And so I got two things to say about that. Number one, I think you're better at listening to the Holy Spirit than you're given credit for. So I actually think your ear is closer to the heart of Jesus when you stay away from the lists of do's and don'ts to establish your righteousness than it ever will be if you keep that close to you. Like, I got to do these and I'll be righteous. But the second thing I have to say about that is sometimes all we've got to do is read a little farther. And if we read a little farther, we will find that Paul didn't stop with the church at Colossae by going, hey, man, you've died in Christ, so all that other junk is don't, don't, don't take your value off that. Good riddance. Go get them. Way to go. Your value's in Christ. No, because he knows better. He knows what you know and what I know, and that is that we got some problems. And I don't want them. And I don't think you want them either. And I don't think you're going to get rid of them by do's and don'ts but I don't think you want to carry them either. So what are you going to do? (laughs) 
So you've hit some sort of conundrum. So go to chapter 3. See, here's a little Bible study trick. You can keep reading when the chapter ends. I know that's a basic ABC elementary, but you wouldn't believe how many Christians have to be taught that because they read their Bible in chapters or they read them in four or five verses at a time. And they don't realize that Paul did not break this into chapters. Paul didn't stop and go chapter three. (laughs) Paul just kept writing. We did this so that it would be easy to teach in a public setting and go, chapter 3, verse 1. It's a lot. You ever see like someone write six handwritten pages? What if they, you just got up and said, okay, we got to count which paragraph we're in, line 49. So you break it into chapters and verses, it makes it easier. So let's just act like Paul didn't break this up at all. He just keeps talking. And he says this in chapter 3, verse 1. So, if you've been raised with Christ, time out. Just stay right there for a moment, and I want to remind you of something. You don't have to look back. You can just think on this. Verse 20. If you, grow, if you died with Christ. Verse 1. If you've been raised with Christ. Same theme. If you died with Christ, then why in the world are you living according to codes? If you've been raised with Christ. Chapter 3. So a lot of what we're doing is preaching moral codes to people who need, think they need them because they don't know they've died with Christ. If we preach that you've died with Christ, we could start, we could let go of rules and regulations and start to introduce people to a resurrected reality. I just did a sermon along those lines last Tuesday night called Beyond the Cross. If you haven't watched it, watch it. A message where I really try to parse out a lot of things I dealt with and never really having a revelation of the resurrection for years, re-die, re-die, re-die. And then needing to be raised in Christ and having this revelation of God's love and His grace has really been picking me up out of. Not, Not that I don't see the cross and its value, but that I see the empty tomb and the fact that I'm alive. So if I'm alive, why would I go back to the way you used to do things? by rules and regulations, wouldn't I go on to something else? What would it be if I actually believed I was alive now in Christ? So let's go back to it. Verse 1. If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Okay, good news. I died with Christ. I'm alive in Christ. When Christ makes His appearing, I'll know, you'll be able to see what I really am. In the meantime, you can't see what I really am. I know what I really am. I'm resurrected in Christ. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Ooh, here we go. This is the money stuff. This is the, you've got problems. What are you going to do with them? And there's two different ways of living, according to this text. You can live under the elemental spirits of the universe that tell you don't touch, don't touch, don't handle, don't taste. That's how you're going to get by. And Paul said, I'm scared you're buying into that garbage. He said, the reality is, is you're crucified in Christ and you're alive in Jesus. And the job to lay this stuff down is yours to lay down. Put to death this garbage in your life. Do it. Not taste not, touch not, handle not, so that you're righteous. Do it because you're righteous. Don't do it to be righteous. Do it because you're righteous. Lay them down. Paul, what if I can't lay them down? Great question. What if I can't lay them down? What was Paul's answer? If you died, then you're also risen. Set your mind where it belongs. Set your mind on the things which are above not on the things which are on the earth. In other words, set your mind on what you can't see, not on what you can see. What can you see? I'm a fornicator. I'm an adulterer. I'm a murderer. I got a filthy mouth. 
What can't you see? I've died in Christ and I've risen in Jesus. I am his wisdom, his righteousness, his redemption, and his sanctification. Set your mind on what he says about you. That's heaven's value system. Earth's value system, I'm an adulterer. I'm a murderer. I'm an idolater. I'm a fornicator. I'm trouble. Heaven's value system, you died in Christ. You've resurrected in him. Go live like it. As long as your mind is in the realm of the natural, you are going to only go to work in the natural. But when you start to see what he thinks about you in the realm of the invisible, you begin to see the things in you that don't belong and the strength to mortify, the old King James says, mortify or put to death those members belong to you. This is you meeting him. Not to do good in order to get good or do good in order to get favor, but it's you meeting him with all of your stuff. Recognizing that you died in Christ and you are alive in Christ. And although you don't see all of the things you need, it's in him. Chapter nine or chapter three, verse nine. Look at this. Here's, here's another one. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices. Some of the old translations say seeing that you have put off the old man. Right? You have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. So what if, what's really happened? You've had your old clothes taken off of you. I like what Eugene Peterson says in the message. This would be my title tonight if I were to title this, Our New Wardrobe. He says, you've taken off your old wardrobe and you've put on a new wardrobe. We are expected to live according to the value of our new wardrobe, not the value of the systems of this world. The value of my new wardrobe is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of its creator. Look at verse 11. In that renewal, there's no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Can I read that to you in the message? Listen to this. I'm going to take this slow. Listen to these words. Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and put in the fire. Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the Creator with His label on it. All the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish, non-Jewish, religious, irreligious, insider, outsider, uncivilized, uncouth, slave and free mean nothing. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. Amen. Go, Paul, go. When I read that, I go, go, Paul, go. He goes, but you know what scares me is that you don't know it. And that you're going to determine your value based on what you don't touch, what you do, what you don't do, where you, that's the garbage you got saved out of. And he goes, don't fall for the elemental principles of the universe. That's the elementary way people live is don'ts, don'ts, and do's. He goes, you're better than that. It doesn't mean you're, you're showing up perfect. It means you, you recognize you got a new set of clothes. Put them on so that you can start to lay the old off. So for those that say, if you hear too much of God's grace, you won't learn how to live, I say only if you keep feeding on the natural. If you keep feeding on the natural, you're right. You'll have just enough theology to get you in trouble. In fact, I would say this. A lot of people that have heard the message of grace and found themselves in spiritual trouble, the problem is, is they got enough theology to get them into the grace of God theologically, but they kept feeding on the, the system of the world, and all they did was get an excuse then to go do whatever. They had no true identity. They still based their... They started to base their value on what God thought of them because they, they had grace. 
but they didn't, they didn't allow anything to drop off of them because they kept their minds on the things in the temporal rather than the things in the eternal. It, it stuns me when I go into a church. When I go into a church, it stuns me how long we have to spend talking about sports, weather, Republicans, Democrats, presidents, congressmen, Supreme Courts, constitutions, Bill of Rights, local sheriffs, crime, before we can ever get to the praise and worship. And I'm not just talking about in the lobby or the parking lot. I'm talking about like in the opening prayer and in the testimonies and in the sermons. It's stunning to me how locked in we are to fixing the system. And man, hey, go fix the system. But you've put on a new wardrobe. Your identity is Christ. Your identity is not obsessed with the things of this but the things of that. So, if you want to see the resurrected life of Christ, set your minds not on the things temporal, but on the things which are unseen. I didn't say it. Paul said it. This guy would not go over today, man. He would not be popular. You know who else wouldn't be? Jesus. He would be wildly unpopular in his own church. This is incredible that Paul goes, look, man, if you want to live the resurrected life, you got to get your focus up. He says, if it's too much here, you're going to fall for the elementary principles of the system. You're just going to, and they're going to suck you in to touch not, taste not, handle not. You're going to be determined to turn the world over morality wise. He goes, but if you want to really see it happen, you're going to have to live as if you've died in Christ and you're resurrected in Jesus. Get your head up. Pick it up. Not earthbound, but heavenbound. Let me leave you with one more thought. Uh, there was a, 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 a message quote from earlier in this chapter. I just liked it. And I'll just read it for you. Peterson said this. You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without Him. Go, Eugene Peterson, go. You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without Him. Amen to that. It's an empty place without the crucified and resurrected Christ because all it is is that which is in the temporal. But because He lives, we have the eternal. What we really are, folks, are followers of a resurrected Jesus. We're just nuts enough to believe He's alive. And if He's alive, we ought to live it out. And that's what we're doing, living out the reality that Jesus lives. And I've died in Him and I've resurrected in Him. Let's pray. Just apply this in your heart. Just think about this little title, our new wardrobe. What's that new wardrobe look like? What does it look like? It's not defined by do's. It's not defined by don'ts. But it doesn't keep you from removing your clothing that doesn't fit. There's going to be some things that doesn't fit because you're resurrected. So take off what doesn't fit. Don't take it off so you can be righteous. Take it off because you are. Don't take it off so you can live. Take it off because you're alive. Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity tonight to talk about Jesus. The beauty of what Christ has done in dying for us on the cross, bringing us into his resurrected reality. Lord, I I, I know we've waded into some deep waters tonight. That's That's what I love about this, to wade into some deep waters. And in that deep water, sometimes we look around and wonder, where to go next? What do we do? What do we do with our knowledge, with this information you give us? So, Father, I I ask that your Spirit do the work of planting the deep roots into the soil of our hearts of the things you would have for us to grow on and to know and to grow by. That, Lord, as we leave this place, we don't leave having achieved all the answers. We leave having realized that the seed's been planted that you're doing something great. And Father, I don't expect we'll get it all at once, but I do think that, Father, in in this singular moment, one thing can begin, that we begin to look to that which is unseen 
and give it more respect than that which is seen. And if we can just start there, according to your word, that's the answer to putting on the new wardrobe. So I may not understand that wardrobe. I may not understand much of what it means to really be resurrected in you. But if I can start by focusing what I don't see, I know you'll do the rest in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.